Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want to have the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath. For that Sabbath was a solemn feast day. They asked Pilate that the legs be broken and the bodies be taken away. Accordingly, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the men crucified with Jesus, first of the one, then of the other. When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. One of the soldiers thrust a lance into his side and immediately blood and water flowed out. This testimony has been given by an eyewitness and his testimony is true. He tells what he knows is true so that you may believe. These events took place for the fulfillment of scripture. Break none of his bones. There is still another scripture passage which says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Gospel for today's feast, the feast of, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And I always love to begin the appointments that I have in my office with the Gospel of the day. And today will be no exception. In fact, already has not been an exception. A heart that was pierced for us, a heart that was broken for us, a heart that was opened to us for our life, for our salvation, and for our healing. There was sacrifice and suffering involved. In fact, that was the very nature and core of, of his love, fulfilling his own words. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for your friends. You know? You are my friends if you, you keep my commandments. Those powerful words from the Gospel of John uh, connect and they resonate with us in, in so many ways, especially through this past year of uh, the COVID pandemic and what we've been through and what we continue to face. But I did want to walk through a letter that I sent to all of the priests and deacons and all of the parishes here in the Diocese of Fresno and I wanted to break it open a little bit as I, as I read through it, uh, because it really does beg for that. So, be patient. <laughs> My dear ones in Christ, over the past year or so, I feel as if I've been anything but the bearer of good news, and isn't that the truth? I must say, however, that even though we are about six months away from the celebration of Christmas, it is my joy to bring you glad tidings this day. Now, I'm not an angel clad in white. I don't have a trumpet. We're not in Bethlehem, <laughs> but there's good news. Effective on Saturday, June the 19th, 2021, our pastors and administrators may open up our churches for the celebration of Mass, the celebration of the Eucharist, and for all sacramental services at 100%, 100% of the normal capacity of our worship spaces, and that's without social distancing. Don't get too excited yet. <laughs> We're not alone in this. Most, if not all, of the bishops of California will be following suit that same weekend. It is a long time coming, and although we still have a way to go, and we do, I'm proud of the way that you have all navigated the troubled waters that we have been through, and that we are still in, again, I often refer in my own spiritual life, my own journey, my own struggle with my weakness and sinfulness that I, I tell the Lord in my prayer, uh, Lord, I'm not out of the woods yet. And I wonder if I ever will be out of the woods, but I tell you what gives me comfort. In fact, it's Psalm 23. Yeah, Even though I walk in the valley of darkness, I fear no evil, for you are there by my side with your, your rod and your staff to give me comfort, to give me courage. Well, that quote is certainly something that applies to all of us during this pandemic. So we might still be in the woods and we might still be uh, trying to navigate through these very difficult and troubled waters, and, and we will be, but some good things have happened. There are other welcome changes that will also go into effect at the same time, although they will be accompanied by a few adjustments, and those changes include the following. The sign of peace at Mass may resume, although we ask that physical touching be limited to one's own household. 
you are encouraged to offer the sign of peace to others by way of a simple bow or a wave of the hand. I'm reminded of a wonderful time, gosh, over 30 years ago. I had the, the wonderful joy and privilege of visiting the country of Japan, specifically a, just a wonderful Japanese nun, a Japanese sister, uh, from whom I was asked to go and celebrate her 40th anniversary as a professed religious. It was beautiful. Then I spent some time traveling. But I would go to liturgies there, and the liturgies in Japan, all in Japanese, of course, were the most solemn and reverent that I have really ever been part of. And that includes some of the most solemn masses I've ever celebrated or, or been at, or that I ever served when I was a little boy, uh, serving mass at the, the, the Tridentine Rite, now known as the Extraordinary Rite in the Roman Catholic Church. These Japanese liturgies were uh, just beyond uh, beautiful and reverent. And I remember at the sign of peace, there was no touching at all. There was no pandemic, no, no virus going around. It was more cultural than anything else, an expression of their Japanese spirituality. So at the sign of peace, they would offer it, but no touching, just a very reverent bow to the person and people around you. I can't really imitate that Japanese bow. I tried to, and I still do, but start practicing when we do the sign of peace. Also, and this is a change very close to my heart, congregational singing may begin again in earnest. I know it's begun in some ways. I, I certainly uh, bent the rules and broke some of those rules at funerals uh, during this past year, at uh, ordinations too. I, we've, we've done that. But now we can do this uh, together and, and in earnest. Musicians and choir members, you are asked to observe sensible health precautions and pastors are encouraged to exercise their own good judgment for all of this, including whether or not the use of masks is advisable in a particular situation. So for example, although we're not requiring social distancing when it comes to the choir, if you can set them apart for a, a bit of a distance, uh, use your judgment, uh, my uh, brother priests. Liturgical processions may begin again during the liturgy, that is, entrance processions, which we've been doing anyway, offertory processions, again, uh, with just use common sense, uh, certainly processing forward for the Eucharist. And then also, the collections may be taken up at the normal time, although it is highly recommended that baskets not be handed one, from one person to another. Holy water may be made available to the faithful at any and all of the fonts around the church. Maybe, again, pastors, use your good judgment. Distribution of the Eucharist by way of the chalice is still going to be suspended for the faithful uh, until further notice. And anyone distributing Holy Communion should be masked, and the preferred manner of receiving is still in the hand. In any case, any case, please keep hand sanitizer nearby. I'm going to say something here, I probably shouldn't, but certainly in my experience this, this past year, as I have been giving communion and most receiving in the hand, it's almost almost impossible for me to, to do that without some skin-to-skin -skin contact unless I irreverently would drop the, the host, which I'm not going to do in the, the hand of the recipient. I must say, in my experience, that as I've given communion on the tongue, if I'm careful, then 90, 99% of the time, there's no contact other than the host and the person's tongue. So, my brother priests, don't deny communion for someone on, on that level. There may be reasons for denying people communion, which the bishops are going to discuss in June, but I don't believe that this ought to be one of them. If someone approaches, and they want to receive on the tongue. Don't scold them. Don't lecture them. Give them the Eucharist. If they approach in the hand, give them the Eucharist. Be as careful as you can possibly be, just in terms of, of contact, more for their comfort and safety than your own, because it's not about our safety, brothers. 
It's not about our comfort. It's about the people. So if they kneel in front of you to receive communion, do not scold them. Give them communion. If you feel called to say, please talk to me after Mass, that's fine. Have a discussion uh, <laughs> and a dialogue about that. Uh, be, be kind and convincing. Uh, anyone, uh, again, uh, uh, who does ministry to the homebound, uh, that ministry may resume, but we will ask that you will use the 2021 guidelines, uh, revised guidelines, and those have been sent out. They were attached with the letter. So brothers and sisters, as I said in the, in the introduction of this announcement, we still have a way to go in terms of dealing with the pandemic. We still do. We're not out of the woods. But we are getting closer to a more normal way of gathering and celebrating. So please observe the following basic precautions as these changes are implemented. Do practice frequent hand washing and the use of hand sanitizer. Uh, in my own heart and mind, that, I, I believe that to be the most effective. Avoid shaking hands or other physical contact with anyone other than members of your own household. If you do, wash your hands. <laughs> Use the sanitizer. The wearing of face masks is still very much encouraged indoors. It is recommended that pews be cleansed and sanitized at least twice on Sundays. We have been doing that in most places after every single use of our space. Uh, but we're recommending certainly at least twice on Sundays. We feel that would be sufficient. And that would also apply in the case of multiple services on any given weekday or when there are, for example, in their baptism, there are confessions, and First Holy Communions, which are generally done now, confirmations also generally finished now. But quinceañeras and weddings, uh, just be mindful of uh, the sanitation. This is really good news. Apart from the Mass and the other sacramental moments, other ministerial, catechetical, and social gatherings may, may resume, but only if the simple health precautions that I just outlined are observed carefully. Special precautions, of course, should be taken by pastors and administrators for events at which food is distributed. For special events, contact our Risk Management Office for guidance and approval. And keep in mind the R3 trip and function form is still required to be submitted for approval. Like parental discretion that we hear about at the movies, pastoral discretion is advised. So again, my brothers, my brother priests, deacons, and others in charge of, of truly pastoring our people, be good pastors, use good judgment. I trust you. Finally, and most importantly, the dispensation from the obligation to attend Sunday Mass is hereby rescinded, and that will be effective from Sunday, June the 20th, 2021. It's Father's Day. From that day forward, all the Catholic faithful of the Diocese of Fresno will be obliged to attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Pastors and priests especially, please, be very attentive and pastoral toward those who cannot fulfill that obligation or who are not obligated to attend. As we know, pandemic or not, the obligation does not apply for those who are too sick to attend, those who are caring for someone who has a serious uh, health problem or condition, or for those who might have some other serious reason for being absent. I received an email very recently in a I need to respond to them personally this afternoon since the, my letter is already out. A beautiful uh, mom and dad who have a large family, I believe seven or eight children. Uh, one of their children uh, has autism and really cannot be left ever un unattended. And so they have been sp splitting the family. The half of them goes to church while the other half remains at home. They come back. And then the other half goes. It's so beautiful. I wish all of, all of Catholics in the Diocese of Fresno, all over the world, had that same, that, that same beauty of, of conscience and that, that same attentiveness to, uh, to our obligations and these wonderful uh, essential opportunities to gather and, and to receive the Eucharist. Anyhow, they're dispensed. Of course they are. 
uh, they're taking care of this precious child, this beautiful gift from God. And uh, that is certainly a condition that would qualify for uh, the dispensation outside of uh, the, the blanket dispensation that is now being rescinded. So very important for us to address these issues on a case-by-case -case basis. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, specifically numbers 2180 and 2181, can be very helpful with your pastoral approach in this regard. Also, we've learned a few things during this past year, and the live streaming of our Masses will surely benefit those who cannot attend in person for the reasons that I just stated. <clears throat> Let me end this good news with a simple quote from the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy from the Second Vatican Council. It comes from number 48 of that document. The Church, therefore, earnestly desires that Christ faithful, when present at this mystery of faith, should not be there as strangers or silent spectators. On the contrary, through a good understanding of the rites and prayers, they should take part in the sacred action, conscious of what they are doing with devotion and full collaboration. So yes, my brothers and sisters, it is good for us to gather again for the Sunday obligation, to celebrate the mysteries of our faith on the holy days of obligation. I would call them holy days of wonder and holy days of opportunity to grow in our faith and in our, our love of each other, of the Lord, of the Eucharist. God bless you and those you love always and in every way.